Warm greetings from wonderful Indonesia. We've got a delicious mission ahead of us and we are going to eat our way across Indonesia, a country of over 17,500 islands with 600 ethnic groups and an incredible diversity of cuisine to match. It's like nothing I've ever tried before. An explosion of flavors in your mouth. You could eat a different dish every day for a year and still have so much more to try. Wherever you go, one thing you will find, Indonesian love noisy food. Mm. The Asian Food Network has found Indonesia's must-have dishes, so we are going off the beaten path on an amazing food odyssey mapped out by our favorite foodies. Now it's time to celebrate with Indonesia's best ever eats. Lake Toba is over 100 kilometers long and 30 kilometers wide, making it the largest volcanic lake in the world. The lake formed following a massive volcanic eruption 75,000 years ago. It only takes two and a half hours to fly from Jakarta to Silangit, the airport of Lake Toba. From the airport, the lake's famous Samosir Island is a three-hour scenic drive. Lake Toba is the birthplace of the Suku Batak or the Batak tribe, one of the largest ethnic groups and earliest organized cultures of Indonesia. On the shores of the world's largest volcanic lake, this unique culture has created some wonderful specialty dishes. When in Lake Toba, you simply must try Naniura. It was a big surprise for me. The first time I ate it, I never guessed there was an uncooked fish dish in Indonesia. And Naniura really represents our diverse nation, and I love it. It is known as Batak Ceviche because the fish is prepared first by marinating in the juice of special lime called Asam Juga. It is very sour. The fish is not raw like sashimi, but it is uncooked. In fact, Naniura means uncooked in the Batak language. It's chewy, spicy, citrusy, and tingly. I had a shot at preparing naniura at home. The acidity from the lime and the salt, it firms up the fish really nicely, giving it a lovely texture. Lake Toba is a ground zero for a spice that is hallmark of Batak cuisine. Andaliman is found only in Lake Toba volcanic soil, making it very special and another reason to visit. Not one, not two, but three separate seasoning must be prepared for this dish. The first is a medley of flavors. Herbaceous turmeric and galangal, the warm spicy zest of fresh ginger, nutty candlenut, earthy coriander seeds. These ingredients are toasted for extra flavor. The second seasoning requires thinly sliced shallot, torch ginger, garlic, red chilies, lemongrass, local chive known as bawang batak, and of course, the spice that is a staple of Batak cuisine, andaliman. Chives, andaliman, and torch ginger are mandatory for Batak cuisine. These three seasoning are combined and ground into a paste. The challenge is to refine the texture. It must be silky and free from fibers. The aroma is a tantalizing blend of spice, zest, and delicate herb hints. Once the fish has been cured in lime juice, the paste is massaged into the flesh and it is left in a chiller for about five to six hours to let the flavors really infuse before the fillets are sliced and served cold. But our people only use fresh fish from the lake, so you must Pre-order. Remember this tip? Pre-order. The flavor of the marinade complements the freshness of the fish and Lake Toba has been added to my bucket list. For starters, this lake is bigger than my home country of Singapore. I heard that long ago, this dish was reserved for royalty. That's true, but do not worry. Today, there is no such rule. 
However, Naniura is usually reserved for special occasions, such as engagement, where exchanging gift is customary. For Bataks, a gift is a symbol of respect to one spouse to be and an offering to God. If you were a Batak bride, you would give your husband Naniura. For a very special occasion, Ikan Batak, a local fish from Lake Toba, is used in Naniura. Today, Ikan Batak is rare. So now carp or Ikan Mas that are easy to find are used. Naniura is so special, it has a song. O Amang, O Inang, O Inang, O Amang, Parsinuan. Loas au, loas au, Mangaritri tutoba hobuon. That's lovely. So it's about a man wishing to marry a woman from Danau Toba so he can eat fresh naniura whenever he pleases. How romantic is that? Did he marry you for love? No, for the fish. I'd marry someone for fish. Whilst naniura will have you singing for more, this next must try dish will have you hitting the warungs or lapos, as they say it in Lake Toba. If you love lomi, this is the lomi with an extra kick. Ni goma. The best noodle dish in Lake Toba. This is a breakfast delight that packs a punch and it comes in really satisfying portions with plenty of bang for your buck. There is a lot to love about this batak spaghetti. The pasta is special noodle called Milidi, named after the Lidi straw room. Luckily, it doesn't taste anything like straw. These noodles are soft, chewy, and thicker than typical noodles. Mmm, imagine al dente springy noodles tossed in a thick, spicy coconut milk soup with fresh citrusy tones, a tantalizingly tingly sensation, and topped with a hard-boiled egg. You might want to grab a pen and paper and start taking notes. First, the noodles are boiled, strained, then the coconut soup is prepared by sautéing a fine paste made of shallot, chili, garlic, turmeric, touched ginger, along with a fragrant kaffir lime leaf, lemongrass, and andalima. Chicken or another meat is added next and then doused with a nice layer of thin coconut milk. Lemongrass and kaffir lime leaves are added in, and the aroma is simply divine. So, can I get a bowl of that right now? You can almost taste it. Can I? Right? The mi absorbs all the yummy flavors, making it really delicious. There's the tingling, numbing effect from the andaliman, along with the richness of coconut milk, chicken stock, the bumbu, and the other vegetables. The challenge is getting the ideal amount of andaliman. Too little, and there is no tingle. But too much, and it's like a mouthful of hot massage balm. Many Batak living abroad stock up on andaliman, freeze it and use it sparingly to remind them of home. The word gomak means to take by hand, which is precisely how mi gomak was traditionally portioned out and added to a customer's bowl. I really want to try this, but I'm not sure about bare hands dishing up my food. Don't worry, mi gomak sell are very hygienic these days and using utensil. Oh good! Now, there's a modern version of this noodle classic, fried mi goma. The cooks reduce the liquid, allowing the noodles to sizzle in the wok, turning them golden brown. Many young Indonesian chefs have added new flair to this classic and made mi goma a popular dish on modern menus. Long live mi goma. Now it's time to check out a region known for classic ethnic Indonesian food where traditional dishes have made a splash 
in culinary circles. Let's head to Li Kupang at the northeastern tip of Sulawesi in the Minahasa region where the cuisine is strongly related to cultural identity. Minahasa people love to party with singing, dancing, and lots of food. As they say, lebih baik kalah aksi daripada kalah nasi. So it's better to drop the action than the rice. Style and appearances are of little concern. Great food is all that matters. These people are serious about food. To reach this foodie paradise, jump on a flight from Jakarta to Sam Ratulangi Airport. Flight time is just under three and a half hours and the overland journey to Ligupang takes 90 minutes. Minahasa is famed for their exotic recipe, utilizing unique local ingredients. But one thing the region is truly known for is sambal, rija. My aunt would make all these wonderful Indonesian sambals and send them to us in boxes. My favorite has always been Dabu Dabu. It has these beautiful sour notes and it's fresh like salsa. Plus, it's really, really, really yummy. A mix of bird eye chilies, thinly sliced shallots, ripe and green tomatoes, finely chopped lemon basil leaves, bittersweet calamansi lime juice with a drizzle of coconut oil and a dash of salt and pepper creates this delightful, colourful condiment. And there is a specific fragrant aroma from the basil leaf and tangy lime that makes your mouth water in Sunday. And that's the magic created when chili is combined with the zest of citrus. Moving up the spice ladder is another famous sambal, Richa Richa. I love sambal Richa Richa with its natural sweetness. This is the Sultan of Sambal. So spicy. Richa actually means spicy. Richa Richa hits you like a train, which shouldn't be surprising since chili is the main ingredient. People in North Sulawesi love Richa Richa so much, they even eat it with fried bananas. Something most Indonesian consider to be a dessert. Hmm, that sounds really good actually. I once dated a Minahasa local. When it comes to family gathering, they love potluck. But you better watch out, as you might find some extreme food on your plate. And yes, everything was served with sambal. Wow! Two spicy favorites already and there's still more to come. If you need any more proof that North Sulawesi is the home of fiery flavors, then look no further. Woku is a cooking method created in this region, but be warned, it is spicy! Woku is all about the sauce and it can be used to cook all kinds of meat. In the hinterland, they prefer red meat or chicken, but on the coast, it is a seafood dish. An absolute standout in the great tradition of Woku style food is Woku Blanga. I love Woku sauce. It's beautiful, thick, savory, and spicy, made by crushing roasted candlenuts, turmeric, fresh tomatoes, ginger, and shallots. Of course, it wouldn't be complete without spice. So bird's eye chilies join the fray. Aromatics like lemongrass, kaffir lime leaves, pandan, and turmeric leaves take this sauce to another level. Next up, the star of the show. A plum chicken rubbed in lime and salt is cooked in the paste. And if things weren't spicy enough, green chilies are added. The sauce becomes thick and sumptuous. And all that's left to do is a sprinkle of fresh kamangi leaves for a sweet, crunchy finish. Buku Belanga is really flavorful with so much richness from the bumbu. It's really spicy but also balanced. Woku Belanga has a complex taste due to using local grown herbs. This is a patani of farmer's food. And everyone has their own version of this dish. This dish has come to mean so much to Minahasa people that a wedding would just not be complete without Boku Belanga as part of the spread. The modern way of cooking Woku Belanga is in a clay pot. But in the past, the dish was cooked in a wrapping of Woku leaves. 
hence the name which has come to be associated with the spicy sauce. The Minahasa believe that what they eat will also be consumed by their ancestors, so they strive to serve only the best. In the past, wrapping food in woku leaves was considered a prestigious way of presenting meals. The people of Minahasa also believe that eating spicy dishes, like woku belanga, is an important life lesson. The fiery sensation from the combination of spicy, savory, and bitter flavors creates balance. It's a reminder to find balance in the way we lead our life. Who knew that spicy food could teach us so much? As the Minahasa people would say, Nimbole makan kalonda ada richa. One cannot live without spice. But don't worry, for those who can't take the heat, there is still hope. Another speciality that locals find hard to live without is chakalang fufu. Chakalang are skipjack tuna and are found in large numbers of Likupang's deep, pristine waters that are teeming with marine life. Indonesians were pioneers of food preservation techniques. The tuna was smoked to cure it and to extend its shelf life. Amazingly, this dish is still served smoky and dry to this day. Chakalang fufu is usually shredded and simply mixed with anything you like. Must have my fufu. Here's another dish for those with a milder taste palate. A wonderful meal created out of necessity that over time has morphed into a tasty treasure. Rice shortages were not uncommon in the past, for instance, during the Japanese occupation of World War II. Forced to hide in the jungle, people got creative, gathering and cooking wild vegetables, which was the birth of bubur tinutuan. Bubur translates to konji or porridge. A jungle porridge? Okay, why not? One wonderful discovery was gedi leaf, a specialty ingredient in Minahasa recipes. Gedi leaves have a slightly bitter but pleasant taste, like a cross between spinach and seaweed. Nowadays, bubur tinutuan is a popular breakfast dish across the archipelago. This is a rich, tasty konji that is heavy-bodied and textured. The ingredients are delectable. Lemongrass and ginger flavor the water before the rice is added. The leafy vegetable come next before sweet corn is added. The aromatic steam give a hint of great taste to come. Pumpkin or sweet potato Cassava and getting leaf come next, and the pot is left to simmer as the congee thickens. Finally, water spinach is added along with salt and pepper. Once the water spinach wilts, the dish is ready to be served with richa richa to add some fire. Bubur tinutuan is often served at intimate family events, and because of that, is also known as bubur bersaudaraan or camaraderie porridge. And with that feeling of camaraderie, let's move to another area of Indonesia, known for their friendly welcome and hospitality. The easiest way to get to Labuan Bajo is to take a direct flight from Jakarta, and in just under four hours, you will land at Komodo International Airport. Western Flores is home to the indigenous Manggarai, who have inhabited the island for thousands of years but the area owes its name to the Bajo people, one of the last nomadic sea gypsy tribes that has lived on the ocean for centuries. With such a special connection to the sea, it is not surprising that one of Labuan Bajo's most iconic dishes involves seafood. Ikan kuah asam is considered one of the Labuan Bajo best ever dishes, popular throughout the island of Flores and the rest of eastern Indonesia. Ikan kuah asam juxtaposes the sweetness of fresh fish with a super clean sour broth. Fresh turmeric gives it a bright sunny colour and a wholesome taste. It reminds me so much of a dish my grandma, Nenek, used to make. Curries were too spicy for us as kids, so Nenek would cook singgang, which is very, very similar as a way to include us in family meals. 
This is a broth that has so much love poured into it. Shallots and garlic are sautéed until fragrant. Lemongrass and cafe lime leaves create a beautiful aroma. For a sour punch, tamarind water or saundaling is added. A splash of lime, a handful of Indonesian sweet basil and the dish is done. The key to this dish is getting the right amount of sourness without overdoing it. And of course, using freshly caught fish. After trying ikan kuah asam in Labuan Bajo, you may never want to eat seafood anywhere else. The locals say in Jakarta that ikan mati dua kali. The fish have died two times or more. What I find really amazing is the way the Bajo people catch their fish. These sea nomads are known to be the best free divers in the world. To be able to dive 30 meters for a good 10 to 15 minutes without any gear to catch fish, that is so amazing. It makes me want to eat that fish even more. There is a belief that sea gypsies have a way of communicating with the fish and are able to call the fish with just a few knocks on their wooden boats. They call me the fish whisperer. The whispering I like. Hmm. Now, most people don't pay very much attention to the rice that accompanies their exciting dishes. Rice is rice, right? Well, this next dish isn't your run-of-the-mill rice dish. In fact, it is not rice at all. Nasi jagung or corn rice is mashed yellow or white corn mixed with grated coconut and coconut millet and then steamed. This is a Labuan Bajo classic. Originally, corn was a staple crop in Labuan Bajo as it suited this dry region. However, locals started incorporating rice into the dish when it became a mandatory crop. It is mild, the perfect pairing for the intensely flavorful dishes of Labuan Bajo. While nasi jagung plays the role of sidekick in Labuan Bajo cuisine, our next dish is colorful and has no problem standing out in the middle of any plate. Rumpur Rampe was an eclectic mix of tropical plants, very healthy, <laughs> very colorful. Traditionally, harvesting ingredients for this dish would involve being barefoot, feet touching the earth as you forage for the best ingredients in season. Rumpur Rampe is a spiritual dish. Seasonal vegetables, the success or failure of the crops are believed to be the signs from God of what is beneficial for man's nourishment. The locals believe that disease and shorter lifespans are linked to modern eating habits. Edible plants that once nourished our ancestors have been replaced by non-heritage crops that are deemed ineffective in helping man thrive in the ring of fire. Rumpu Rampe, however, is a reset. It uses cassava leaves, an ancestral plant promoting metabolism, and papaya leaves and flowers that have antioxidant properties. Very healthy and beautiful, with green leaves, yellow papaya flowers, and red chilies. Rumpu Rampe is complex in flavor. There is bitterness, spiciness, savoriness, all in one. And a good cook can balance out all these flavors. Get it wrong, and the locals will say there's a disconnect between the cook and the ingredient. The leaves can be boiled or soaked in water to take the edge off the bitterness. Every region has their own way of minimizing the bitterness of papaya leaf. In Java, cream mud is used, while in Labuan Bajo, the papaya leaves are boiled with cassava leaves. Each element is prepared with care, boiled or steamed separately, respecting each ingredient's timing for doneness. Next comes banana heart, which is massaged with salt to extract the sap, then rinsed, sliced and steamed. Shallots, garlic, chilies, salam leaves and kaffir lime leaves are sautéed, creating an aromatic paste that is absolutely delicious. The veggies are added along with fried anchovies for a nice savoury crunch. Finally, the dish is removed from the heat and raw grated coconut is mixed in. While ikan kuah asam is easy to find, rumpur rampe is quite rare. It is reserved for special gatherings like weddings. 
what Om William is really saying. Next time you visit Labuan Bajo, try to crash your wedding. The intimate relationship between food, culture, and ceremony is woven through the rich diversity of Indonesia. And our next stop is no exception. But here, food takes on a role that is beyond tasty nourishment. At our next destination, the locals say, in life, choose simple food made from your own effort, rather than luxurious fare that tastes insincere. We are heading to the island of Lombok, about two hour flight from Indonesia's capital, Jakarta. Lombok is renowned for its warm, welcoming people who cook from the heart. Add to this, Kuta Mandalika with its amazing beaches, new resorts, and international race circuit. And there's even more reason to visit. The name Lombok originally meant straight or seaweed, but across Indonesia, it has another meaning, chili. Chili? That means all the dishes must be spicy. Yes, fierce hot, with a great story to put. In 1630 AD, when the kingdom of Salaparang in Lombok and Karangasem from Bali were at war, Rambiga village was chosen as a place to negotiate peace. At the time, poultry was only served on special occasions. So the chef created Ayam Taliwang, which brought the people together and peace was restored. Food for peace. All fights should be resolved over a good meal. I'm going to burn down your village tomorrow. Could you please pass the chicken? Oh, well, I guess I won't burn it down completely. Happy tummies make happy people. I love ayam taliwa. It can be insanely spicy, but the combination of spicy, smoky, sweet, salty flavors is worth the burn. This is grilled chicken street food fair that is made with free-range spring chicken. The first time I have such a small chicken was in Lombok. Give me two. Easy. I want more. This is my favorite dish in Lombok. Ayam Taliwang is made with a special paste called Bubu Taliwang that is absolutely wonderful. Essential to the marinade is Trasi Lombok. The first time I taste Trasi Lombok, I knew it was something special. Terasi Lombok uses the freshest prawns mixed with salt and it's left to ferment for two weeks. Bumbu Taliwang is made from red chili or sebi asap, a curly red chili, local bird's eye chili, shallot, terasi Lombok, and palm sugar. This marinade is very fiery. In fact, many non-sasak find it too hot to handle. It's similar to peri-peri, but with an extra kick. The traditional way of cooking ayam taliwang involves splitting the chicken open without cutting it right through. The chicken is rubbed down with salt and lime before being grilled over coconut shells to impart a beautiful aroma. Before it's seasoned with bumbu taliwang and grilled once more until you smell that rich, smoky aroma. Steamed jasmine rice and a warm salad with bean sprouts are popular side dishes for ayam taliwang, topped off with steamed grated coconut and kangkung, aka water spinach. I love how each bite gives you a variety of luscious textures. Mm. In the old days, customers would often wait two hours for their orders, and the chicken was so fresh. And the cooks was still trying to catch them. My first time eating ayam taliwang was such a surprise. Next to the soup was a tube of toothpaste. So customer could use it to help to remove the smell of trashy from their finger. True story. Could there be anything more satisfying than a classic chicken meal? 
Well, how about this next best ever dish? It is succulent, tender, and a creation fit for kings and queens. The history of Sati Rambiga goes way back to the 17th century and can be traced to Rambiga village where the kings would gather. The name Rambiga comes from the word Rambuk, meaning together. And what would a royal gathering be without incredible food to feast on? Today, it has become a dish for all with its delicious flavor and supremely succulent beef. Beef is the pride of Lombok. The region's savanna provides the perfect pasture for cattle grazing, resulting in grass-fed and organic cattle. This sata is so tender, it just melts in your mouth. Sweet, smoky, savory, fiery. This is one of the moose half dish. Moo! Got it? Cow? With a sense of humor like yours, I'm pretty sure the cows of Lombok will be mooing over you. To come to Lombok and not try sate rebika, this like going to Japan and not having sashimi. Sate Rambiga is so popular that tourists are only allowed to live with 100 sticks. Only 100? I was hoping to fill up my suitcase. It's just a saying to show how much people love this satay. Like a lot of Indonesian food, Sate Rambiga is about getting the right balance of flavor. It needs to be sweet, spicy, and smoky. That's right. Sate Rambiga is all about the balance of spice. Sabi Balek, a big, juicy red local chili is mixed in the marinade with palm sugar, garlic, shallot, blatan, tamarind water, and coriander seed. The beef is wrapped in papaya leaves and set aside for one to two hours before being smothered in that beautiful marinade and grilled over a charcoal fire until just done. Oh my goodness, so you have to wait a couple of hours before you can tuck it? No problem, Ili. The sate seller always have rambiga ready to go. Sate rambiga is typically served piping hot on a banana leaf with lontong rice cakes, boiled papaya leaves, a lovely bone broth, and warm aromatic pepes or banana leaf wrapped seafood for a complete taste sensation. So get in line. Can you imagine sitting with the kings of Pajangik sharing sate? Yes, I can. Your Majesty, please could you pass me a few hundred sticks? I need to pack. Lombok cuisine paved the way for peace, creating a bridge between royals and evolving to become a democratic food uniting everyone. The link to a royal past remains a present-day reality in our final sojourn across Indonesia. The region boasts not only an incredibly rich history, but also one of the seven wonders of the world. Yogyakarta is the main gateway to Borobudur, the largest Buddhist temple in the world and a quick one-hour flight from Jakarta. Not a long journey to sink your teeth into some really delicious delicacies. First up, let's explore the dish responsible for Jogjakarta's nickname, the City of Gudun. Every time my Bapa and I visited my Nene in Jogja, we always stopped at the same old Gude place. It has this distinct smell of burning wood and dishes were cooked in a big pot. And they were just so welcoming. They even remember my father eating there when he was a kid. Gudeg is a heavy-bodied jackfruit stew, almost meaty in texture, with contrasting flavors. At first sweet, almost like a dessert, but also savory and tangy. Gudeg perfectly defines the Japanese sweet tooth, which started with a resourceful use of palm blossom to create palm sugar. Later, the sugar trade really shaped the Japanese palate, making them accustomed to sweet cuisine. Nowadays, the sugar level of gudeg has been toned down. But if gudeg is not sweet, then this is not gudeg. 
In the 1500s, the Mataran Kingdom cleared vast amounts of land for building. Many jackfruit trees had to be cut down and the workers, not wanting to waste the young jackfruit, created a dish utilizing the fruit with a slow cook method. Yeah, it does make sense to make use of what's readily available. But I think the other major thing that you need a lot of to make gudeg is patience. True! Gudeg can be really tedious to create as it has so many components and jackfruit is just one of them. Jackfruit is the largest tree-borne fruit in the world. One single fruit can weigh up to 25 kilos. So word of caution, don't go napping under that tree. Large, thick skin and bumpy. Its skin is almost like a crocodile's hide. I'm thinking jackfruit fashion could be a thing. This is a fascinating fruit. It's so versatile, you can use it in a dessert or in a stew. It's a fruit that tastes like meat. Although a staple in Java for centuries, it's only recently become popular globally as a hip vegan meat alternative. You could say we've been way ahead of the curve when it comes to jackfruit. The first element in Gudeg is gori and pinda. Young green jackfruit and hard boiled eggs. Traditionally, Gudeg is cooked in a clay pot line with, wait for it, Thick leaves! Not something you would ever imagine in a kitchen pantry. But this is what gives gudeg its reddish brown color. The young jackfruit is first cut into pieces and then boiled until tender. I would say fall off the bone tender, but there are no bones. Next, it is smothered in a beautifully rich paste of shallots and garlic. For a bright, zesty flavor, coriander seeds are added to the mix followed by roasted candle nuts for a creamy texture. But wait, it's not done yet. Next in is daun salam or Indonesian bay leaves, tangy kaffir lime leaves, lemongrass, and torch ginger that has been roasted just right. And then of course comes the coconut sugar or palm sugar. The ingredients are submerged in water and boiled for around four hours over a wood-fired stove, which gives the dish a beautiful smokiness. Once the gravy reduces, then hard-boiled eggs and luscious coconut milk are added, and the dish is slow-cooked for another two hours. You really have to appreciate the amount of work that goes into this. Gudeg is commonly served with several other goodies. And all together, this is gudeg complete. In addition to the melt-in-your-mouth jackfruit, a gudeg complete could have curried free-range chicken cooked in coconut milk and spices. Then, there is my favorite, sambal goreng krecek, made with beef hide crackers for a soft, fluffy texture with a spicy kick. You can add a side of steamed vegetables, or boiled papaya, or cassava leaves. And of course, areh, a thick, savory coconut sauce to splash on top of your steamed rice. The combination of these sweet and savory ingredients makes gudeg truly Javanese. This dish takes years to master, which is why the best establishments are run by elderly sellers. And it's believed that gudeg is a dish that nourishes the body precisely because gudeg sellers are well into their twilight years. Most of them have been around since the Japanese and even the Dutch colonial era, which is reason enough to try gudeg. Surprisingly, for a meal that takes so long to cook, gudeg is available around the clock in Yogyakarta and is the go-to takeout for late-night college kids. And can gudeg is also a thing now so you can take the taste of gudeg home with you. Now that shows the passion for this local delicacy. Our next best ever dish is a simple yet sumptuous delight that will have you begging for more. The next best ever dish is a savory one-dish meal that was not only a firm favorite in the royal palace, but also the meal of common households of central Java. I tried nasi liwet for the first time in 2018 on a trip to Central Java. We sat on the floor at a local warung and we ate from these bowls that were just folded banana leaves. I remember nasi liwet being really, really delicious. It was moist, but 
every grain of rice had texture and it was all infused with the rich taste of the creamy coconut milk. It's honestly one of the best things I've ever eaten. What's special about nasi liwet? Nasi liwet is cooked in a wonderful three-part contraption that looks like something from a road dal store. It is cooked over wood fire stove. The heat is created in a clay brazier or anglo filled with charcoal. Next comes a tall copper pot, the dandang tembaga, in which the water is boiled to create steam. On the very top is placed a woven bamboo basket or kukusan fring for steaming the rice. Together, these three items create a piece of cooking art. This aromatic rice is put on a rotten plate with banana leaves for added aroma and a splash of are. Are is made from a paste of shallots, garlic, and coriander seeds sautéed with bay leaves and citrusy kaffir lime leaves until fragrant. Coconut milk is added and the mixture is brought to a simmer until it thickens almost to the point of curdling. Then salt and sugar are added for a beautiful rounded finish. It is basically really rich coconut milk that has been cooked with spices. I love it so much. The rice can be served simply with just a steamed omelette on the side or with multiple side dishes like tahu bacem, opor ayam, and tempe bacem, pindang egg, or sayur labu siam. Sayur Labu Siam is a hearty chayote stew to complement the richness of the coconut rice. Super duper delicious. I can't get enough. What I also love about this dish is the special way the banana leaf is folded into a plate known as pinchuk. This is the best leak-proof plate ever and it comes with a spoon that's also made of banana leaves called suru. Folding these items from the banana leaf is an art in itself. It gives the dish a beautiful aroma and is also eco-friendly and inventive. Nasi liwet is a perfectly wonderful way to wrap up our culinary adventures in Central Java. With incredible culture, living history, and amazing taste sensations. Borobudur has it all. From traditional smoky flavors to a ceviche style fish rarity, hearty and healthy food to nourish body and soul, and sweet sensations to share, there are delights to tap every foodie. So be sure to check Indonesia.travel for extra information to help plan your trip and let Indonesia spice up your world. With a country as diverse as this, it is an odyssey for your taste buds. Come with an empty belly and you'll leave full of iconic dishes. Made with love from wonderful Indonesia. Selamat makan and sampai jumpa lagi. This is Indonesia's Best Ever Eats.